It's always weird showing up to somebody's house without an invitation, or when the invitation didn't come from the person you want to see. I can't wait to not have any idea where we are and not actually know where Oh, right, because we don't know what our address is. <laughs> In October of 2022, I was driving up the eastern coast of Grenada with senior producer Ted Muldoon. Where we came down before. We were trying to find the house of a woman named Annie Bain. A year earlier, I had actually tried talking to Annie on the phone. I wanted to know about her husband. He had been a cabinet member in Maurice Bishop's government, and he was one of the people executed by firing squad alongside Bishop in 1983. The remains of Annie's husband have also been missing for 40 years. When I called her, she told me that she was tired of talking about it. It was too painful. Her specific words were, I have thrown this behind my back. But many months later, I happened to meet Annie's granddaughter. Her name is Janelle. And she said, oh, no, you should definitely talk to my grandma. She said she'd put in a good word for us. And then all of a sudden, I got a text with a date and a time and a promise that Annie Bain would talk to me. The only problem was that Janelle didn't quite tell me where her grandma lived. Just go to this neighborhood, and when you get there, ask somebody for directions. That's how things work in Grenada. Let's ask this for people. So Ted and I were trying to find where Annie lived. The other thing that you should know about Ted is that he's actually my partner uh, in my personal life. So in addition to reporting on this project with me, he just heard me talking about this story for a very long time. And we've driven around Grenada for hours on these reporting trips with me in the driver's seat usually, and Ted pointing a microphone at my face. It's very bouncy here. Yeah, I would just try to keep it still. Okay, that's a little quick, try to keep the car still. (laughs) Anyways, back to the search for Annie's house. Hello. Ted rolled down the window to ask a family sitting on their front porch. You see a white gate. A white gate. Great. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. And just down the street, there was the white gate. We pulled into the driveway. And then I saw something that I didn't expect. Something that told me immediately that we were in the right place. In Annie's yard, under a tree, there was a rectangular concrete slab on the ground. It was at least five feet long. It looked like a grave, right there next to her house. There was a vase with fresh flowers on top of the slab, and then at one end, propped up on the slab, was what looked like a headstone. There was an etching of a cross, and then a long inscription. In memory of Norris W.P. Bain, born 28th September 1932, a loving husband, father, and friend who died 19th October 1983 at the age of 51. Although we know not where your body lies, your spirit, though, will always be with us, for you excelled as a father. In life, you taught us to forgive. As a friend, you had no equal, for you never failed to counsel. As we moved into the next stage of life, we will always keep two things in mind. Your love of beauty, because for you, beauty was that which attracts the soul and that which loves to give, not to receive. And secondly, your love for music, for music to you is the language of the spirit, which opens the secret of life, bringing peace, abolishing strife. We truly miss you. Annie Bain was sitting on the porch, waiting for us. Hi, Annie. I'm Ted. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Annie was 87 years old when we came to visit her. She's 88 now. This house is where she had built a life with her husband, Norris Bain. How long have you been here for, this house? A long time? Oh, yes. Yeah. If, if my husband was more than 39 years ago, imagine the amount of years we lived here before. Mm-hmm. Yes, and my children are big children. Look at Jan- Janil, he's 39 years. Wow. When, when the mother Norris, she was 11 months. <laughs> Annie reminded me a little bit of my own grandma. She had on a house dress with red hibiscus flowers, and she moved slowly but deliberately around her living room. She called back to her helper in the kitchen as we got settled. Annie was polite with us. She offered us a seat, but she was also clear. This interview was not something that she would have done if it hadn't been for her granddaughter pushing her to do it. 
I promise that I wasn't seeing any reporter and I'm not going through anything with this thing again. I told Janil no, but Janil begged me to see y'all. I'm sorry, but thank you. <laughs> we're, we're grateful. I told Jan, I said, I forgetting this thing now. <laughs> so after this long time, I'm forgetting. Yeah. She said, no, Granny, you always talk about it, so you know. <laughs> <laughs> As you'll hear for yourself later, her memories of what happened the day her husband was killed in 1983 are perfectly clear. She is one of the Grenadians who witnessed firsthand the rise and fall of a revolution and the rise and fall of a revolutionary leader who her husband and others were willing to die for. Annie was close enough to actually hear the gunfire that killed her husband and seven others, including Maurice Bishop. She knew many of the 17 people who were convicted for the murders. And yet, she's also had to live with the question of what happened to her husband's remains. She has never been able to lay him to rest. The grave in her yard is empty. From the Washington Post, I'm Martine Powers, and this is The Empty Grave of Comrade Bishop. Episode 2. For the last couple of years, I've been working with a few of my colleagues to understand how and why the remains of the former prime minister of Grenada and seven of his colleagues and friends vanished. They were all executed on October 19, 1983. Our goal has been to try to find some answers for people like Annie Bain. Back then, Annie was 48 years old. Her husband, Norris, was 51. They'd been together for a long time. How did you and Norris meet? <laughs> In parties, going to dance, and whatever, yes. Together, they ran a successful business, a hardware store. And by 1983, they were at the age when they could finally start enjoying the things that they'd spent their lives building. Norris Bain had a pretty prominent reputation in Grenada. After the Socialist Revolution in 1979, he had become a leader in the new government. He was the Minister of Housing in the administration of Maurice Bishop. And the two of them were also close friends. Why do you think that he felt strongly about Maurice Bishop? Well, Maurice was a good person, and he... Well... Norris and him was like brothers. I mean, they, they move well. The, the whole team was very good. And, and everything was going very well, very good. I hear people talk about what those four years were like during the revolution and how things changed. Some people say that things changed for the good. Some people say that things changed for the bad. From your perspective, did you feel like you saw things change between... 1979 and, and 1983? Yeah, yes, because there were good things, a lot of good things that Morris did. And perhaps, well, there was things that people wasn't pleased about. Annie didn't say too much more about those years before her husband's death. To her, this isn't a fascinating Cold War era mystery. It's a moment that changed her life forever. You're going to hear a lot more from Annie a little later, and you'll hear from family members of some of the others executed on that 19th of October. But first, I want to take you through Grenada's revolution, how it began, how this charismatic 30-something, Maurice Bishop, rose to power, his triumphs and failures, and what brought it all to a brutal end. It helps explain why the question of what happened to his remains is something that people refuse to let go of. Starting in the 1600s, Grenada was colonized, first by the French, then by the British, then the French again, then the British again. And just like in other parts of the Caribbean, these colonizers brought enslaved people from Africa to work on plantations, 
Sugar was one of the main crops. Britain abolished slavery in the 1830s, but they kept Grenada as part of the British Empire well into the 20th century. After a night voyage from Tobago, the Britannia arrived off the Windward Isles, where Grenada, a tropical paradise, eagerly awaits the royal visitor. At St. George's, the governor of the island, Sir Edward Beathman, extended a warm welcome to Princess Margaret on behalf of the loyal islanders. The loyal islanders. This tape is from 1955. Maurice Bishop would have been about 11 at the time. The impression you get from this news footage is that Grenada is a happy, thriving colony. But the reality was much more complicated. Many people were poor, illiterate, and still working on plantations like their grandparents. And yet, there were also families like the bishops. My family was not about a family that met the people. This is Ellen Bishop Spielman. She is the youngest of Maurice Bishop's three sisters. So what do you mean by that, in terms of your family wasn't a a family that met the people? We were very class-orientated. You couldn't come into our lives if you were outside of our class. If I were to walk from school and talk to a taxi driver, a servant's child, I would be reprimanded, you know? We're pretty stuck up. I was going to say, your family sounds kind of stush from Mm -hmm, from what you're describing. mm -hmm, mm Mm-hmm. They would have been considered upper middle class. But we weren't among the first families of Grenada. We were on that level because I think Grenada is a, a country of complexion. You know, where you, the lighter you are, the more elevated you are. You know, so we were somewhere in between. Not that Ellen paid a lot of attention to race and money when she was young. Her memories from that time are about her family especially her only brother, Maurice, who was almost 10 years older. He was very kind, very handsome, of course. He was my doll, you know. I remember once he took a nap, and I was playing with his hair and twisted most of his hair, and he got up and he was in a rush for a date, and he couldn't get them out. Ellen says everybody loved her brother. He was truly the golden boy of the family, smart, likable, constantly reading, I always carried his books because they were so impressive, so big. His friends were also impressed by him. We all looked up to Bishop. Uh, He was a natural leader, even from high school days. You might recognize that voice. It's Don Rojas. He was Bishop's head of communications, who you heard last episode. He and Bishop were both students at Presentation Brothers College, the most prestigious secondary school on the island. And he saw how Bishop racked up title after title. Editor of the school newspaper, star of the tennis team, head of the students' council, founder of the historical society. We were both on the debate team. He was the president of the senior debating team, and I was president of the junior debating team. We got to know each other very well. And uh, he was uh, developing a political viewpoint from a relatively young age. When you were debating him in high school, do you remember what topics you guys would debate? <laughs> it all some pretty heavy topics, like the Cuban Revolution, for example. What you know, what was it all about? It came to power in 1959. We were still high school students at the time. They debated political theory, international relations, other very important questions. We would talk about um, West Indies cricket. <laughs> I don't, I don't Who's know. the best, the yeah, best cricket right, player right. that's debate for 30 minutes? Yeah, or let's debate how is the West Indies cricket team superior to the English cricket team? <laughs> <laughs> Bishop gravitated to other precocious teenagers with big ideas. One of his other close friends was a guy named Bernard Cord, who was just a couple months younger. They formed a club where they'd deliver speeches about politics on Fridays in Market Square in the downtown of Grenada's capital. Cord would become an important person in Bishop's life, and eventually somebody who would play a big role in Bishop's downfall. Once Bishop turned 19, he went to London for law school, the first step in what his family imagined would be a traditional, prosperous career in law. Except it didn't quite turn out that way. He became disillusioned when he went to England because the stories would come home through letters 
stories of his new perspective on life as a colonial subject. As children, as young people, we would stand for hours and hours at the Queen Park in the hot sun waiting to have a glimpse of the Queen. It was just such a big deal. Black West Indians were expected to regard these rich white people with an almost religious devotion. But in London, that wasn't quite the case. You know, he said he remembered them playing God Save the Queen. And he stood up and then he looked around him and no one else was standing. The respect we had for her here in the Caribbean or made to have for her in the Caribbean wasn't the same as it was in England. We idolize white people and the way we treat everybody. I think that all came to a head for him, that this is not the real world. During his time in London, Bishop got involved with Marxists, black nationalists, anti-colonialists. Other young revolutionaries from around Africa. They had new, exciting ideas about how to end the exploitation of black and brown people around the world. He did a lot of pro bono work while he was in England, in the West Indian community there. He worked on, um, you know, cases of police violence and police abuse against the black community in England. So it won't shock you to hear that the plan for Bishop to pursue life as a traditional barrister, go into private practice, that was falling by the wayside. By 1970, Bishop was back in Grenada with his law degree, his wife, and two children. He was only 25. He was a brilliant young guy coming back. He could have made himself a fortune as a lawyer in Grenada, but he chose, no, he chose to to use his skills uh, in the service of his people. He represented striking nurses at the General Hospital. He fought against a wealthy landowner blocking beach access for regular Grenadians. And he started to make an enemy. This would become a turning point. In Grenada's final years as a British colony, a man named Sir Eric Gary was the premier. He started out as a very popular leader, but over time, some Grenadians began to see him as power-hungry and corrupt. He drove a bulletproof white Cadillac. He held on to power with the help of a private militia known as the Mongoose Gang. Mongoose Gang was a a local term uh, for um, a group of thugs, basically, uh, that uh, were under Gary's uh, control, that would carry out all of his dirty deeds. I mean, some of the most unspeakable crimes and forms of torture. Maurice Bishop got involved in opposing Gary's government. He quickly became a target. They put Morris through a lot. As a matter of fact, this table you're sitting here is where Morris came home quite battered and beaten up by them to have his wound attended to. This is the family dining room table that you're sitting at right now. At one point, Bishop was nearly beaten to death. His head was shaved with broken bottles. He later had to go to Barbados to fix his broken jaw. Gary's violence only ended up radicalizing more Grenadians against him. Even Bishop's relatively conservative parents started to join in on the protests. It was an awakening. So it almost turned my whole family into like revolutionaries. I saw my mother at one point leading a parade, you know, walking on one of the streets of St. George's. In January of 1974, something happened that changed Bishop's life. His father, Rupert, was at a protest. He was shot in the back. People we talked to who were there said that it was Gary's police who did it. They said that Rupert was trying to protect a group of school children. He died shortly after at the hospital. And I think that was the trigger. There is always a trigger to something. How do you get over that? How do you get over your father being shot? A month later, on February 7th, the UK granted Grenada independence. Gary became Grenada's first prime minister. He gave a news conference the next day to mark the occasion. People have tried to get rid of me, and I don't think they can make it. Lots of them who have tried are lying in the cemetery. How did they die, Prime Minister? How are they doing? How did they die? (laughs) (laughs) Natural causes. A couple of years later, Maurice Bishop ran for a seat in Parliament, and he won. 
And so when Bishop won his seat and then later on became the leader of the opposition to Gary in, in the Grenada Parliament, he became uh, uh, enemy number one. Within a few years, Bishop and a group of political allies felt like they had run out of options. They had risked their lives to protest. They tried to vote Gary out, but they'd become convinced that elections were rigged. In March of 1979, Gary was leaving for a trip to New York. Bishop and others thought that this was a bad sign because the worst violence happened when Gary was away. Later on in a press interview, this is how Maurice Bishop described what he understood the threat to be. The plan was that Gary was going to leave the country on Monday midday. And the instructions that were being left behind was that we should be liquidated. Liquidated, as in killed. That left us in a position where we had to choose whether to sit and wait for liquidation or whether we should move on the offensive. To them, the only choice left was a revolution. On that Monday, Maurice Bishop and 45 other men met on a hilltop in the middle of the night underneath the moonlight. They were all close friends who had fought together for years. They called each other comrades, so Bishop was Comrade Bishop or Comrade Bish. From the hill, they launched an armed takeover of the military barracks. By the time they were done, Gary had just arrived in New York. Apparently, all he could do was sit in his hotel room at the Waldorf Astoria while he heard the news that he just lost his country. Back in Grenada, the leaders of the revolution met up at the offices of the country's radio station. They had to address the nation. Maurice Bishop was there. Bernard Cord, his old friend, was working on a speech. Joseph Lane was also part of the group. Lane told us it was almost a foregone conclusion that Bishop would become the prime minister, though he says it took Bishop a moment to accept that. I remember I was around when the speech was finalized in the upstairs, you know, and when, when he was saying, OK, prime minister, you have to make the speech, he was like, what? <laughs> and then Bishop was on the radio. The tape we have of this address is tough to make out, but you can hear his voice, still a little tentative, as he's just come into power. I am now calling upon all the working people, you know, workers, farmers, fishermen, middle class people, and women, to join our armed revolutionary forces as central position in your community. In the speech, Bishop is calling on people from all walks of life to commit to the revolution. And then he went on to make a promise. Things would be different. And in many ways, for a while, they were. Struggle. Struggle for rights. Struggle. Struggle for freedom. Through struggle, we will become When I ask Grenadians about the beginning of the revolution, they all say they felt like they were living through something exciting and new. I could feel a difference in, in terms of the, the, the country at that time. We immediately saw a change in our fortunes when the revolution came. We all had great expectations for the future of this country. It was exhilarating, getting up every morning and just knowing that the day was there for you to paint with whatever brush strokes you wanted to paint. I, I mean, it was just fantastic. So much of that enthusiasm was a direct reflection of Maurice Bishop. You felt that he was speaking to you directly to The old person felt, the grandmother felt, the mother, the father, the child. Maurice was speaking to them. Pamela bullen Cherubin was a teenager when the revolution started. Her dad, Evelyn Bullen, was close with Bishop. You could have touched him when you go out. He was a leader that he was hands-on. So people admired that. You felt like you understand what you are going through, the struggle. You understood where we are and where he wants to bring us to. Pamela says that life in Grenada started to change really fast. The Mongoose gang was gone. 
citizens saw their questions and ideas turned into immediate action. There was a new national public transport system, guaranteed maternity leave, equal pay for women, programs to support farmers, free secondary education for all children. Grenadians understood how the revolution was taking shape, in large part through what they were hearing on the radio. This is Radio Free Grenada. It is now information time, 7 o'clock. Radio Free Grenada was the official radio station of the revolution. It was run by the government, and everybody listened. It was a place where Grenadians learned about what was going on in their country. The Madigra Agricultural Development Project recently planted over 38,000 square feet of white potatoes for sale on the local market. They learned what was going on in the region. In sports, the first test match between India and the West Indies at Sabina Park is equally balanced. And Bishop and members of his administration came on to talk about the revolution and their fight against imperialism. Here's Bernard Cord, who had just become the deputy prime minister under Bishop. The United States is the last country to talk about human rights or democracy because they don't know what that is and they don't know how to spell it in that Reagan administration. A lot of the revolutionary leadership's rhetoric was like this, saying that the U.S. is the last country that should talk about human rights or democracy. Reagan is not just a liar. He's a bold-faced, brazen-faced liar. That's Cord again, calling President Ronald Reagan a brazen-faced liar. For a while, Cord and Bishop seemed like perfect partners. Bishop was eloquent and charismatic, the public face of the revolution. Cord was the brilliant strategist, the guy who could turn ideas into reality. But despite all the big talk coming from the top, Grenada was in a really tricky situation. The revolution hadn't changed the country's biggest problem. It was poor, even compared to other Caribbean countries. Bishop turned to Cuba for help. He went from reading about the Cuban revolution as a teenager to making direct appeals to Cuban President Fidel Castro for assistance. And Castro took to him immediately. He saw Bishop as a kindred spirit and a friend. We established relations with Cuba fairly quickly after the revolution, and then scholarships were awarded. And one of the areas of study is medicine. This is Peter David, a politician and Grenada's former Minister of Foreign Affairs. Back during the revolution, he was the station manager at Radio Free Grenada, among other things. And I remember Maurice saying he went to the airport and he saw this lady crying. It was a day when some students were going to Cuba to study. I think it was the first batch of students going to Cuba to study. And Maurice said he saw this lady crying and he went up to her, why are you crying? She said her son is going to study. And then why are you crying? He's going to, to study, so you should be happy. And her answer was she never thought she would live to see the day when her son would go to study medicine because at the time, medicine was reserved for persons who can afford to pay the high cost of studying medicine in places like, like you in the Caribbean or Britain or Canada or the United States. So, and today, you go to any hospital in Grenada and you will realize that the doctors are the result of the Cuban assistance to Grenada in terms of, 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 of education. So I think those are the things that Grenadians felt proud. In addition to the soft power of educating people for free, Cuba also gave Grenada weapons and military training. So did the Soviet Union. A workers' rally will be held at the St. George's port tomorrow morning to welcome a Soviet ship laden with assistance for Grenada. The ship is expected to arrive in Grenada early tomorrow morning with gifts from the Soviet government and people, which will include heavy equipment for use in our agricultural sector. So, yeah, Grenada was definitely allied with the Soviets. And its leaders were reading Marx and Lenin in study groups, thinking about how to keep the revolution going. But the day-to-day lives of Grenadians were not defined by communism. Churches stayed open. Private businesses continued to operate. I mean, just listen to this commercial that aired on Radio Free Grenada. Just arrived. 
something you've long awaited. A fried chicken. It's not Kentucky. It's not Chukwagan fried chicken. It's quality fried chicken. It has been made with an enticing flavor. I just have to say that this is the sexiest fried chicken commercial I've ever heard. Despite all the anti-American rhetoric, Grenadians liked Americans. Tons of Grenadians had close family living in the U.S. And you heard that story about Grenadians going to Cuba for medical school. Well, in Grenada, there was an American-owned for-profit medical school. It opened in the mid-70s, and hundreds of students from the U.S., mostly white, mostly from around New York, they were living in Grenada, learning to become doctors. That school, by the way, is another thing that put Grenada on the radar of President Reagan. It was a big contributor to Grenada's economy. So Bishop had no problems with the medical school. That's all to say, it seemed for a while that Grenada was going to be able to walk this tightrope. Socialist, but not officially communist. Opposed to the American government, but friendly with the American people. So as not to stir things up too much, they also decided to stay in the British Commonwealth keep the queen as the head of state, and keep the governor general as her representative. They were forging their own path toward a unique vision of success for a small island nation. But it's important to remember how young this government was, not only in its existence, but also in the experience of the people who were in leadership. Like Bishop, most of them were in their 30s. Some were in their 20s. Had we had more experience around us, Had we maintained some of the elder, more experienced politicians involved in the revolution and brought them into the fray, they could have alerted us to the dangers ahead. One of the first big moments that would test the movement happened just over a year after they had taken over. In June of 1980, there was a rally to celebrate heroes of Caribbean history. Bishop and other cabinet members were there, along with several thousand Grenadians. And that is when a bomb went off. Three children were killed and 20 persons injured in a bomb blast today in St. George's. The bombing apparently was an attempt on the life of Socialist Prime Minister Maurice Bishop, who was about to address a party rally at the scene. Bishop was not hurt. A state of emergency has been declared. I've seen photos of the aftermath. They are horrific. And they were published in the newspaper. Four Grenadians were later found guilty for the bombing. That night, though, Bishop gave a speech. He talked about the children who were, quote, murdered by these cowards, murdered by these vicious beasts of imperialism. There were speculations and still are speculations that the CIA had a hand in it. Let me just say, we didn't find any evidence that the CIA played a role in the bombing. When we called the agency to ask about the speculation, they declined to comment. Now, it has been documented in declassified government records that in the 60s, the CIA did try to assassinate Fidel Castro. They'd also supported a coup against the Marxist leader of Chile. But by the 80s, the White House had actually banned the CIA from planning political assassinations. We also tracked down U.S. diplomatic cables that have since been declassified. They show that the State Department seemed surprised by the bombing and confused about who might be responsible. So, look, for Grenadians, this question of whether the U.S. was involved, you can hear it persists to this day. Suspicions about the U.S. are woven into the questions that Grenadians have about everything around this history 40 years later. And at the time, for Grenadian government officials, these suspicions started to make them paranoid. What became clear was that they were internal enemies who were prepared to do whatever it took to stop this process dead in its tracks. Coming up, how cracks in the revolution led to the murder of its leader. I want to take you back for a moment to that speech you heard last episode. Greetings from the free people of revolutionary Grenada. Prime Minister Maurice Bishop at Hunter College in New York, speaking to this adoring crowd about how Grenada had become a symbol of freedom to Black people all over the world. 
But our people also understand that the first law of the revolution is that a revolution must survive, must consolidate, so more benefits can come to them. I'm going to play you a few lines from his speech that I didn't play last time. Because as much as Bishop projected this idealistic vision of what Grenada had become, you can see the cracks in that vision start to appear. And because of this fact, the revolution has laid down as a law that nobody, regardless of who you are, will be allowed to be involved in any activity surrounding the overthrow of the government by the use of armed violence. And anyone who moves in that direction will be ruthlessly crushed. Those are the two words that stick with me, ruthlessly crushed. All revolutions do have downsides. You know, revolution itself breeds counter-revolution. Because remember, once you take power using the gun, which happened in 79, you, in a sense, legitimize the use of that means, and therefore you are now becoming aware that there may be others who have been inspired by your actions to take those actions against you. That's Peter David again, the station manager for Radio Free Grenada. After 1980 and the bombing at that rally, Grenadians knew the revolution was under threat. As you heard before the break, many of them thought the U.S. was plotting against them. Along with concerns about spy activity, there was also the rhetoric from President Reagan. And, as Peter David points out, the fear wasn't just about spies or assassination attempts. Grenadians were also worried about a full-out invasion, that the U.S. might send in troops, take control, and put in place a new government, like they'd done in the past in the Dominican Republic and in Haiti. And then you had Amber and the Amber Days, where the U.S. were actually having war games as a prelude to an invasion. This was a real military exercise that took place in 1981, where U.S. troops practiced an invasion of a fictional Caribbean island nation that they called Amber and the Amberdeens, which sounded suspiciously similar to Grenada and the Grenadines, which is the island chain just northeast of Grenada. So much pressure was brought, because remember there was economic pressure also. There were attempts to stop Grenada getting loans for certain countries. There was attempts to block the international airport. There were attempts to bring such pressure that the revolution did not succeed. So yes, in response to that, and in response to the idea that spies were, were, were involved in Grenada, measures were taken. Prime Minister Morris Bishop has identified national unity as a critical element in the struggle against destabilization plots and to push the revolution forward. He was speaking against the background of an announcement that nine people had been identified by the security forces as being responsible for a recent spate of organized rumor mongering. Organized rumor mongering. That became a charge that could land you in jail indefinitely. People were also accused of being counters, counter-revolutionaries plotting to overthrow the government. An estimated 3,000 people were arbitrarily detained over the course of Bishop's rule, according to Grenada's Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Some later testified that they were beaten and tortured in jail. Bishop, it turned out, was resorting to some of the same tactics as Sir Eric Gary, the previous prime minister that he had fought so hard to bring down. And there were also problems from within the government, the start of a power struggle. Jacqueline Kreft was one of the people affected by this. She was the Minister of Education in Bishop's administration and the force behind programs around the island that taught children and adults to read. She also had a relationship with Bishop, and they had a son together. She was one of the people who was murdered right next to him. Her remains are also missing. She was too committed to helping poor, uneducated Grenadians. And that was her 
total focus. That's her brother, Selwyn Kreft. I should mention that he's also a friend of my mom's. He was living in Canada in the early 80s as cracks were beginning to show in the revolution. He remembers one time when she came to Toronto for a meeting and wanted to make a stop to spend a little time with her brother and his wife. Because of government policy, Jacqueline Kraft traveled with security. And she came to the house with a view to spending the night with us. And the girl said, no, she can't. And I said, you got to be kidding me. She's staying here. Where are you staying? It seemed to her brother that the guard wasn't protecting her as much as surveilling her. And who is she talking to? Why is she talking to this one? You know, all that kind of stuff. There was a obviously mistrust and so on. There was that belief that the revolution was slowing down. Christopher Stroud had been a major in the Grenadian army. People were dissatisfied, you know, at different levels. We were not able to, to deal with the different issues that people had as efficiently as it should, that there was waning enthusiasm for, for the party, that kind of thing. And therefore, the issue was how, what measures should be taken to rectify that situation. This rift started to develop. On one side was Maurice Bishop. On the other side was Deputy Prime Minister Bernard Cord, his friend since high school. And the root of these tensions, well, if you ask different people, they'll tell you different things. Some say it was ideological. One suggestion was that Maurice Bishop thought the path toward communism needed to slow down. and Bernard Cord felt that they needed to go faster. For propaganda purposes, it's nice to see that um, there was big difference in terms of ideological position, but there was no ideological posi- difference between Morrison and, and Bonner. None. Some say it was because Bishop was doing a bad job at managing the revolution, that for all his charisma, he didn't have the skills to govern, and that Bernard Cord, the strategist and the details guy, that he should have a leadership role equal to Bishop's. But other people say this rift was actually all about envy and ambition. Bernard Cord was jealous, I would say, of Bishop and Bishop's fame. The people of Grenada did not respond to Cord the way they responded to Bishop throughout the revolution. And uh, that didn't sit well with him. No matter what the reason, there was a rift at the top of the revolution, and there was no going back. It was the beginning of the end. In September of 1983, things started to move fast. The power struggle escalated. The party voted to force Bishop to share power with Cord. Bishop initially agreed, but then, according to people around him at the time, he changed his mind. In response, his own military placed him under house arrest for almost a week. The thing was, while there was the split in the party, most Grenadians still backed Bishop. So his supporters made a plan. They would gather at Bishop's house, bust him out of house arrest, and take him downtown to the market square. The thinking was that there, he could address the people and reclaim his place as head of government. It was October 19th, 1983. Annie Bain told us about that day when we visited her. Well, in the community, they were trying to get transport for people that wanted to go down because they said they was going to go and release Morris. There was buses picking up people, trucks picking up people to take them down to St. George's. Everybody was organizing because they said they had to get him out. As a reminder, Annie's husband, Norris Bain, had been the Minister of Housing. He was a close friend of Bishop's, and he'd been trying for days to get Bishop out of house arrest. Norris was organizing for buses to go down and to take people down there because they was going to free him. Pamela Bullen, who you heard earlier, her father, Evelyn Bullen, was also planning to help. And that morning, his brother told him, listen, I want you not to get involved in anything that is happening, if it's demonstration, is it? And my father responded, well, I have to be with Morris. I have to be at Morris' side. A crowd of people marched towards where Bishop was being held. It didn't take long for the protesters to free him. Bishop was placed in a car alongside Jacqueline Kraft. But he didn't go to the market square. 
Instead, Bishop's car headed to a fort in the capital where the military was headquartered. Fort Rupert, named after Bishop's late father. It was the center of power for the army. Pamela and the crowd of young people followed behind, chanting. And when they arrived at the fort by the early afternoon, the soldiers there surrendered. It seemed like the masses had spoken and they had been heard. These cheers you're hearing are from video footage recorded that day. Bishop, Jacqueline Kreft, Pamela Bullen, and some of Bishop's allies who had led the demonstration were now sitting in a windowless room inside the fort. Annie Bain and Norris Bain were there too. Some of the details and archival tape of what happened next, the descriptions of violence, may be difficult to listen to. I went up on the fort. Norris was there. They all, all of them was there. And the upstairs. People would chatting, talking. I mean, people were, okay, we free our leader. Things are back to normal. But I was feeling uneasy. This thing is not finished. This thing is not finished. I'm not feeling good. Morris was there chatting with the people. And I thought, you know, Morris had things in control. And suddenly we heard, boom! A rocket-propelled grenade blew a hole in the wall. The faction of the military aligned with Bernard Cord had shown up. They were retaking the fort by force. And then the ray of bullets started to come in. Morris' instruction was, everybody get down on the floor, do not make noise. Just pretend that they have killed us. And he said, oh God, they are shooting at the masses. They could hear that the soldiers were also starting to fire on the crowds outside. One side of the fort extends above a cliff, and in the rush to try to escape the shooting, people started leaping off the wall, falling onto boulders 50 or 60 feet below. We know that at least a dozen people died during all this shooting, and many others were injured. And in the room where Bishop was hiding with Annie, Pamela, and the others, bullets were still flying. The bullets was grazing me. Oh, my gosh. Passing close to me like that. Cut, cut, cut. Annie was hit in her arm and in her hip. And you don't know where you're going to, who's going to get hit next, but you were just there praying. Those of us who never prayed before and believe in God, suddenly we believe in God. A teenage girl who had been sitting by Annie and Pamela had been shot in the head, but she was still alive. So after the barrage of bullets and so cease. You heard them talking outside and asking for us to come out. We took the injured girl and we, all the women, we carried her. And that was a way for us two to escape. All, she was on top of us and we held on to her. So many of us carrying one person. And Jacqueline Kreff was with us. Jacqueline, Norris, Unison, Morris, they all came out alive. What? They lined them up there, and they said, to stay right there, you stay. My husband driver came, and he told him, Mr. Bain, let's go. And one of the soldiers said, you could go, but he had to stay. The, the driver could go, but, but Norris had to stay. let him go, and Norris had to stay. And the same thing with Mrs. Kreff. The soldier called out to Jacqueline and tell her, get out of the line, and took Jacqueline with them. Why, why didn't they let Jacqueline leave with the rest of the women? Because she was a minister of government. She was with Morris. So they already had the other government ministers who was on the fort with Morris inside that room. Pamela and Annie carried the injured girl to the hospital, where the girl later died. So we went to the hospital, hoping that my dad would come in as one of the wounded. When I went outside to check to see the wounded that would just drop at the door, I saw a soldier, um, a militia guy passing, and I asked him, have you seen my dad? He said, Pam, yes, I saw your dad. I saw him shirtless with Morris and others lined against a wall. And it doesn't look good. Shortly after, both Pamela and Annie heard a sound come down from the fort. It sounded to them like a burst of machine gun fire. 
Well, I told the nurse that was with me, I said, oh, Lord, this is the end. This is the crucifixion. I told her, this is like the crucifixion. She said, no, don't believe that. They can't kill people like that in Grenada. I said, you wait and see. I said, I'm sure that they're shooting them. They're killing them now. They wouldn't know for sure until later that night. The most eerie period of the days, maybe about six o'clock. Getting dark, the environment was tense, wondering what what the hell had happened. Peter David was still at work at the radio station. There were almost no cars on the road. Bus service had been suspended. Children had been pulled inside their houses. It even felt like the breeze had disappeared. The radio station is on a hill, so it's looking over St. George's. As the person in charge of the station, I receive a news release. And the news release says at the fort, it was shooting, and they listed the persons who died. To tell the truth, I didn't believe it. I didn't believe it. I thought, no, this is just a, some kind of sick joke, you know? But then someone else arrived at the radio station the general of the Grenadian army, Hudson Austin, who would later be one of the people found responsible for the executions. He came with two armed soldiers. He looked over some prepared remarks, and then his microphone went live. Brothers and sisters, the delegation from the Central Committee of the New Jewel Movement. This recording that you're hearing, I know, is hard to understand. This is one of the only copies of this radio broadcast that exists anywhere. It might be the only full copy. We got it from a former med school student, an American who had his tape recorder running while he listened to this broadcast with his two roommates and their Grenadian housekeeper. At that moment, people were sheltering at home all over the country, playing out similar scenes in living rooms and roadside shacks and inside the palatial mansion of the governor general, Groups of people were huddled around radios, dialed into the frequency of Radio Free Grenada. And Peter David could imagine them all leaning in, concentrating on the general's every word. The revolutionary armed forces were forced to storm the fort, and in the process, the following forces were killed. Maurice Bishop, Unisa Whiteman, Vincent Noel, Jacqueline Kerr, Norris Bain, and Fitzroy Bain, among others. The armed forces then evacuated the wounded. And it was like if the entire country got quiet. It was like a hush. Education Minister Jacqueline Kreft was dead. Foreign Minister Unison Whiteman was dead. Annie Bain's husband, Norris Bain, was dead. People that everyone knew... Evelyn Bullen and Evelyn Maitland, Fitzroy Bain and Keith Haling, and Maurice Bishop. He hadn't just led the revolution. For four and a half years, he was the revolution. All of these people are friends. All of these people are like family. These are my mother's friends, my father's friends. These are people we slept with. Some people we lived with, people we laughed with, people we... To this day, I mean, you know, the guy's in a prison are my dearest friends, the guys who who went to jail for this. And the guys who died, my dearest friends. The details of the executions didn't become clear until the criminal trial, where members of the military who had been at the fort that day spoke about what they'd witnessed. These witnesses were soldiers who had watched the executions. According to them, an officer and four soldiers ordered Bishop and the seven others to line up against a wall. The men were told to remove their shirts. There were accounts that Fitzroy Bain and Jacqueline Kreft tried pleading with the soldiers for their lives. The officer, Callistus Bernard, told the soldiers to open fire with machine guns. Callistus Bernard was convicted for the murders along with 16 other people. He declined our request for an interview. Christopher Stroud, the former Army major who you heard from earlier, he was among those 16 convicted. He was at the fort that day, but he says that he wasn't in the courtyard when the killings happened. Bernard Cord, Bishop's comrade in the revolution and his deputy prime minister, he was not at the scene when this happened. 
But what prosecutors argued later was that he had orchestrated the assassination. Cord was also convicted and served time. He now lives in Jamaica. We reached out to him, too, but he told us through a representative that he didn't want to talk. In writings and interviews over the years, he has never admitted to ordering the executions. But he has also said that he takes, quote, moral and political responsibility for what happened on October 19th. For Peter David, it wasn't only that he lost friends that day. He told us that he also lost his hope for the future. And I guess it's one of the worst days of my life. Because at that point, at that point, you knew the revolution was over. And that's what we had lived for. I couldn't understand how that could happen to my sister, who was so sincere, so genuine in what she was doing. This, again, is Selwyn Kraft, the brother of Jacqueline Kraft. And, uh, you know, it's hard to get, to get past that. Because she was such an extraordinary person. And um, she, was my, she was my hero in so many things. Ellen Bishop Spielman was in the U.S. when this happened. She still remembers the last phone call she had with her brother. I think he was more concerned about reassuring me everything was going to be okay. You know, that I should take care of my family, you know, do that. If I... If I had come, <sighs> so many of the victims' family members still wonder if something could have gone differently. I feel guilty sometimes that my dad gave his life for me. I feel guilty. Again, Pamela's dad, Evelyn Bullen, was one of the people who died with Bishop. She, like the other family members, has no idea what happened to his remains. I also feel that I was not able to say goodbye. Even now, I do not even know where my dad is buried. And so there's always, sometimes you see somebody in a crowd and you wonder, is that my dad? Did he escape and live in another life? And you look at the person, no, that's not my dad. So you're always expecting him to just appear. On the night of October 19th, Annie Bain, the wife of Housing Minister Norris Bain, was nursing gunshot wounds. She was scared for her life and for her children. But one question became her central focus. Where was the body of her husband? The following day, the next day, the 20th, the morning of the 20th, I called the undertaker to go on the fort and ask for Norris' body. The fort was where the executions had happened. He went. They refused to give him. I called a, f- a phone, this number, I got a phone number and called on the fort. And somebody answered. And I asked them where I could locate the body, where I could pick it up. The guy that answered said, I put you on to another number, somebody else, another person. They did. He put me on to give me another number to call. When I call the other number, they tell me the same thing. I say, well, I'm calling. I'm Norris Bain wife, and I'm calling to know where I can locate his remains, his body. The guy tell me, he wasn't in a position to tell me, but he'll put me on to somebody else. And it went on and on. And what makes it even worse is that the people responsible for her husband's death... They had now taken control of the country, and they had announced a 24-hour shoot-on-site curfew, so Annie couldn't leave her home. Her husband had been executed. Her family was targeted. But to Annie, none of that mattered. She needed to plan a funeral for her husband. Why was it so important to you on that first day to start the process of trying to get Norris's body back? Because it's my husband, and he, he was an innocent man. He hadn't done anything. Nobody could point a finger at him and say that he did anything wrong in Grenada. Mm-hmm. No. In the following days and weeks, Annie tried desperately to recover her husband's body. She made so many phone calls, pleading with people she thought were in charge. I tried, you know. I called Governor General how many times I call and beg. 
Last year, when we were sitting with Annie in her living room, she still had no answers about what happened. The grave outside her house is empty. That's the way it is. 39 years. 39 years that man left that house. And today, the 19, 39 years, he haven't returned. This is what this mystery looks like for some of these family members. They were with their loved ones moments before they died. They know how they died. They know who was responsible. And yet, somehow, their remains disappeared. Every 19th of October, this thing comes up. Every 19th of October, that comes up. And no answer. Without no answer. You give up hope that nothing wouldn't happen again. But even though one person is trying and one person is calling and one person wants information and one person wants to know where their husband body is, where it lies, or whatever. Please, respond. What we didn't know before we arrived at Annie's house is that she, unlike many others we'd spoken with, she saw something back then. Something that has had her convinced for all these years that someone does know what happened to the remains. They knows. There is people that knows why, why somebody can come out and see what happened. They wouldn't kill you for that. That's next episode on The Empty Grave of Comrade Bishop. Episode 3 will be out next week on Wednesday, November 1st. But subscribers to The Washington Post can access it two days early on Apple Podcasts. If you're already a subscriber to The Post, you can connect your subscription automatically through The Washington Post channel on Apple Podcasts. And if you are not yet a Post subscriber, go to WashingtonPost.com slash subscribe or look for the link in our show notes. This show was reported and produced by me, Martine Powers, along with Ted Muldoon and Renny Svernovsky. Our editors are Sarah Childress and Renita Jablonski. Fact-checking by Nicole Pasulka. Mix editing by Theo Balcom. Our series theme and music is by Keshav Chandradas Singh. Mixing, sound design, and additional music by Ted Muldoon. Our show art was designed by Lucy Nayland. Project editing by Casey Shaper. Also, a special thank you to Allison Michaels. The recordings you've heard of Radio Free Grenada are courtesy of Gail Poole and Joe Galati. Additional archival recordings courtesy of Caribbean Insight Television. We also want to shout out a book that was a very helpful resource in reporting this episode. It's called The Assassination of Maurice Bishop by Godfrey Smith. If you want to hear more about the rise and fall of the revolution, definitely check it out. And we have an episode guide for this series, where you can see photos, videos, and documents related to our reporting. You can find it at WashingtonPost.com slash Empty Grave. Finally, if you have been appreciating what you've heard so far, we would love if you could rate and review us on your podcast app and also share it with friends and family that you think would be into the story. Thank you so much for listening to The Empty Grave of Comrade Bishop, and we will see you next week for Episode 3. <laughs>